There's an urban black ghetto just north of the University of Pennsylvania that we began to work with collaboratively in 1967. And we're available to them as a resource in their self-development effort. That neighborhood has undergone major transformations. It's won 17 national awards. It's now one of the nicer residential areas for low-income people in the city. It's called Mantua. It's uh, 80 city blocks with 22,000 people in it, 99% black. We have weekly meetings with the leadership of that community in my office to discuss next week's activities. We're in the middle of one such meeting when a member of the community came in and made an announcement that stopped the meeting dead. There was an 83-year-old woman in the neighborhood who headed up what we call the geriatric set. She had organized the retired people in the community into an active force for development. They had opened up three infant care centers places where infants could be taken care of so their mothers could go back to school or work. They had opened up a series of daycare centers for older kids but pre-kindergarten. They had cleared empty lots and made them useful for recreational relaxation purposes, planted trees and flowers and things of that sort. They had swept streets. Now we were able to do something for that woman, fortunately. That neighborhood contained not a single medical service. We got the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania to open up a free clinic in the middle of the neighborhood. This enabled her to go monthly for a checkup. She had a bad heart. She had gone for her monthly checkup that morning. They had put her through the usual battery of tests and told her she was okay and she left to go home. Home was two rooms in an old converted house, fourth floor. On the third flight of steps, she had a heart attack and had died. Now that's the news that was brought to us. It was silence in the room. The first one to speak up was the professor of community medicine. He said, Dem and I have been telling you we need more doctors at the clinic. If we had more doctors at the clinic, we'd be able to make house calls and this never would have happened, which was clearly true. Silence followed. Finally, the economist in the room spoke up. He said, Sam, there's no shortage of doctors. There are plenty of doctors in Philadelphia. The trouble is they're private practitioners. She didn't have any money to call one. If her welfare payments were larger, if she had decent health benefits, she would have had a doctor come to the house, even if there weren't any at the clinic. Absolutely true, isn't it? Silence followed, and the professor of architecture said, why don't we make them put elevators in those buildings? And the only woman present, a professor of social work, shook her head and she said, what a pity, none of you know anything about that woman. Don't you know she was married and had a son? Her husband deserted her. But by cleaning house, she sent her son to school. He graduated from high school as valedictorian, got a scholarship to Penn, came to Penn, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts at the top of his class and got a scholarship to the law school where he graduated in the top of his class and is now a senior partner in one of the largest law firms downtown Philadelphia. He is married and has two kids and lives in a beautiful bungalow out in the main line, a fancy suburban area of Philadelphia. And if she weren't alienated from her son, she'd be living with him or she'd have all the money she needs and no steps to climb. Now what kind of a problem was it? Was it a medical problem, an economic problem, an architectural problem, or a social work problem? None of them. It was a problem. What do the adjectives tell you? They tell you the point of view of the person looking at the problem. Not a damn thing about the problem. But the way we run a corporation is entirely contradictory. The marketing department notices a reduction in share of market in the Northeast region. Aha, we got a marketing problem. Now, experience of people operating in a systemic way have found that over 90% of the problems that appear are best solved somewhere other than where they appear. Why? Because every problem is itself the product of interactions, not the action of parts. And therefore, you have to understand the interactions to find the best place to enter the system. I could give you all sorts of examples of production problems that have been solved in compensation of salesmen, for example, by looking at the interconnections and entering the system at the critical point, putting the leverage at the point which will have the greatest improvement. Now, there are lots more implications of systemic thinking. 
But the important message is that until we start to think as, as systemically, even the best intended efforts like these panaceas will continue to fail because they're being implemented in a way which is contradictory to known principles of systemic behavior. The educational institutions in our country ought to take the leadership, not the followership, in disseminating this knowledge. Thank you. the way people are trying